Hello, um, and welcome to our weekly share on the Parsha with the commentary of Ramosha Alshech. It's uh, been getting extremely nice feedback, which is very, very pleasant indeed. Uh, this week's share is obviously on the double Parsha, or rather, this week's Parshas are two Parshas, Matas Mase. However, we're going to look at Matas, and we're going to look at the part of, of uh, Matas, which heralds um, the, the, the death of Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, I'd just like to start, actually, by dedicating this week's share in the memory of Iser ben Yosef, and uh, his neshama should have an aliyah in the schus of the Moshe, the Taurus Moshe Alshek that we're learning together. And let me remind all of you that if you'd like to dedicate a share um, on the Alshek and our weekly share uh, to somebody you love or somebody whom you'd like to um, provide a, an aliyah for their neshama, just email me at this address, yy at drawbyyy.com, yy at drawbyyy.com, and I'll be more than more than pleased to dedicate the shear in the name of well, the, the use of night. Okay, so uh, we'll start off. Uh, I should uh, remind uh, you all that it's a great idea to have your homish uh, ready so that we can uh, all be on the same page, as they say, uh, which would be obviously a nice thing to be. And uh, we are going to be, if you look at chapter Lamadala, but if you didn't, don't have uh, your, your uh, homish to hand, don't worry, I'm about to share my screen with you. Um, but maybe it would be a, a nice idea for you to take a screenshot and then you could have that uh, on the side perhaps while you're watching and you can refer back. Okay, so let me just do the share screen thing. And if I do that, then, and hopefully if I move this out of the way, can I shrink this? I can. There we are. And this is the bit we're looking at here. So we really have to pay attention to the the words of the Chumash, which of course is the, the basis of the laser analysis of the al his technique. And um, let's have a look. V'yidaber Hashem el Moshe Lemor. And Hashem speaks to Moshe to say, Nekoim nikmas b'nei Yisrael, avenge the vengeance, I suppose you could translate it that way, double expression of vengeance, Nekoim nikmas uh, from the Midianites, and afterwards, I'm going to have to clear my throat, excuse me. <coughs> uh, hopefully that will be better and you can hear me better. Afterwards, you will be gathered to your people. Uh, you will you'll pass away. Your neshama will come back to heaven. But Moshe and Moshe says to the people, gather for yourself or set aside Contingents of men to fight in the army, we you call Al Midian, and it will be a war against Midian. Was says Nikmas Hashem the Midian to for there be to be a war of vengeance on behalf of Hashem, or to avenge what they did to Hashem. We'll come to that shortly against the Midianites. That's all we've got time to to look at and uh, analyze the the Alshik's words in this. And he's going to ask four questions. Um, so I'm going to, if you've taken your screenshot, that's good. But I'm going to point them out and point them out in the much where we're going or where he's going with them. And here are the four questions of 14 he asks on the first six psukim. We'll look at four of those on the first two or three psukim. So he says the following thing. Number one, question number one. He starts off by saying, Roy losim leiv. That's normally how he starts means it's appropriate for you to consider. It's an invitation to use your mind and think carefully. Aleph, question number one. Al kefo, nikmas, nikomas, elu, orma, nikam, nikmas. He says, why does it have a double expression of avenge, avenge? When there's only one war and one act of vengeance carrying on, why is there a double expression of vengeance? That's a good question. Now remember, the, the Torah is written precisely by, or dictated precisely by Hashem. And as a consequence, every word is perfect. Every meaning is perfectly crafted to the form, style, the, the, the way that the words are written. If it's in the singular, there's a reason for it. If it's in the plural, there's a reason for it. If it's in the plural, it should be in the singular. There's a reason for that as well. So a double expression. Why a double expression? There's only one war of vengeance going on. 
Question number two. So that's, let me just point that to you. Yudab Hashem al-Moshe, Lemar, Nekoim Nikmas Bnei Yisrael. Nekoim Nikmas. Venge, avenge. How does the English translation, this is the art scroll, how do they translate that? Take vengeance. So because it doesn't read well in English, avenge, avenge would be, sound strange, they just, they just ignore it altogether, just translate it into good English. But in translating it into good English, you've lost the Hebrew. You all probably played the game, it's called uh, Broken Telephone in the United States. It's called Chinese Whispers in, in England. Um, but probably that's not politically correct, so they'll have changed that to something else. Um, but the idea is a bunch of kids, somebody says something, he whispers it to the next, the next, the next, the next. And by the time you, the, the, it comes full circle and somebody says what he thinks he heard, the, the message is distorted and twisted and totally different to the original thing. And the children share the original message and everybody here uh, shares the end message. And it's extremely funny if you're about seven or eight or nine. Anyway. Basically, that's exactly what happens when it comes to the translation of the Torah. It was first, first translated into ancient Greek, which is totally different to modern Greek, and then from that into Latin. And then from Latin, it was translated into other languages. The famous King James I of England and VI of Scotland uh, translated it into English, commissioned it to be translated into English. But now we're getting that children's game. And now we get to the art scroll, which is a beautiful translation. I'm not being critical. But I know as a translator, and somebody's translated three Hebrew books, that every translator is a commentator. Uh, and you want to choose uh, a translation that conveys the message, but only part of the message. As soon as you abandon the original, you're changing the original. So again, notice that a double expression, nikmas, nikom, nikmas, benetral. Avenge the vengeance of benetral, take vengeance, is the, is the English translation. And the Alshach wants to know why it's a double expression which you would not see. It's interesting to put yourself in the place of somebody who's just reading it in English, even a good English translation, a faithful Torah, faithful translation. Take vengeance. That's number one. Two, Lama Zeh Tola Asifus Moshe bin Akamazu. Why should it be that the end of Moshe's life is predicated, depends on this war? Because it says, uh, fight this war, and afterwards you'll be gathered for your people. So before not, when this happens, that's your time is up. What's the connection? What's the point of that? That's the second question. Question three. Orm of Yedabar Moshe El Om Limor. And Moshe speaks to the people and he says, send for yourself an army or get an army together. What does it mean? Redama Moshe and Moshe speaks to the people, Lemur, to say, to say what? To say what? It doesn't say. And then it says, Hechotzu. And then it says, do something else. Separate or get volunteers for an army. But what was he supposed to say? And number four is very interesting. It's a bit long. So, uh, When this is double expression that we've been puzzling about before, um, when it says that, then he says the following thing, you do a rotza kodesh baruchu ti in the commas midian biyodoi. When he's speaking to Moshe, let's look at the Yadav Hashem and Moshe Lemar, nekayim nekmas b'nei Yisrael. He's saying to Moshe, go and fight a war of vengeance on behalf of the Jewish people. You have some mesas oig b'yad Moshe, just like the, the war against oig was in the hands of Moshe. Moshe did that. Im kain, ech yosir adob amilov, yomar echot zimitchem. So why doesn't Moshe do it? Hashem says, let's look at that again. It's a very, very good question. This. Vidabar, uh, sorry, what's the place here? Uh, yeah. Vidabar Hashem and Moshe Limor, the kind nikmas in Israel. You go and fight, Moshe. A war, that's the Hebrew. How does it do it here? Take vengeance against that. Again, we're losing the, the whole point of the Hebrew here. It actually says, Moshe, go and fight a war of vengeance on behalf of the Jewish people. Against the Midianites. And after you be gathered to your people. But what happens? Uh, you will gather an army and you will go and fight. And as you know, Moshe doesn't go and fight. So if Hashem says you should go and lead this army, you, as you've done before, when you fought against Og Melech and killed him, 
you personally killed him. And that's what he seems to be telling him to do here. How on earth can Moshe refuse? Good questions, I think. Now, as I say, there are many, many questions the Alsha goes on to ask. <coughs> I'm afraid we don't have time for all of them. So let's just remind ourselves what we, uh, what this whole story is fl fl uh, flowing from or falling on from, which we covered in our share last week. You'll remember that the whole incident, um, like when the Midianites, there was two things that went on, two events. And indeed, if there was a subtitle for tonight's share, um, I've written here a story of twos. It's a story of twos. As you see, there's a repeating pattern of twos. Because if you remember from last week, when the Jewish people settled in a place called Chitim, then there was two things, if you remember, what happened that happened there. The Benos Moab, the daughters of Moab, came, and they came and seduced and got the Am, and they kept saying the Am, the Am, the Am. Three times they used the word Am. The people to get involved in idolatry and sexual immorality. And we noted last week there was no Mechumash notes, and we, and we saw through the eyes of the al -Shif, there was no reaction from Hashem when the Am got involved in this appalling behavior. But when, the, when it was the Midianite woman who seduced the, the, Jewish, the Jewish men who were referred to as the as Israel, that's the ones who should have known better and could have known better. That's when Hashem was angry. Now, so let me read to you what he says here. And really, it's a, it's a, it's a question of twos. He says, Omnum, in Ikosalamana, Kawishne Sugi and Voyas. There were two offenses that went on here. Echod Alide Benois Mov, Echod Alide Benois Midian. One against the Midianites uh, and one against the, uh, the, the Moabites, or one because of the Midianites and one because of the Moabites. Okay. Now, when that happened, therefore, that's why it's a double expression. Nakom Nikmas. A double expression. Why a double expression? So he says something which is very interesting. Um, when it comes to uh, a war, so again, two things have happened here. Again, it's twos, remember? We're talking about a study of twos. There was two offenses. Hashem really only get angry, and therefore, consequently, the death of the 24,000 people was as a consequence of the Midianites. Okay, stage two. Stage two, says the al Shukh, there are two types of war. There's a type of war which has conducted and kills human life. A sharp sword, a gun, it ends a human life. Because the Alshak says here, but it doesn't in the ending of a human life contaminate a human soul. There's another sort of war, and that other sort of war is an attack on the Jews' souls. This is a very intriguing idea. And if you consider this, um, but there are two Jewish festivals which echo and resonate with this concept. One is the story of Purim, and one is the story in which, of course, we, we have the Megillus Esther. And that is when the Jewish people are exiled um, in Persia, and there's an attempt by, 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 by Homan to completely wipe us out. That's that sort of war. Then there's the Hanukkah story, a different kind of war. In the, in the, in the story of, of the Book of Esther, it made no difference whether a Jew was willing to throw in the towel, abandon his or her beliefs, and become a Persian. Homan was a Hitler, and he simply wanted to kill all the Jews. That's a physical death. In the Hanukkah story, the Greeks looked for a spiritual death. Jews were welcome as human beings, as long as they were human beings whose thought process was identical to that of the Greeks. That was an attack upon Jewish, the Jewish soul. And of course, as we all know, they banned all sorts of observation of the Torah, teaching the Torah, Greece Mila, anything that signaled the celebration of Shabbos. Um, was it Samuel Pepys, the famous English diarist, noted that more than the Jews have kept Shabbat, Shabbat has kept the Jews. It was to rob us of our souls. So two types of war, and these two types of war are reflected in, a, in two annual festivals. Hanukkah, a war on the soul of the Jewish people. Purim, uh, a, war, a war on the body of the Jewish people. And I can't resist reading the whole al to you. Listen to this. He says, Oid, um, We should consider Yasev boy as kola oris amoris 
And, and this, what I'm about to read to you, he says, right here, it will answer all the questions we, we raised above. Two types of wars. And he mentions, of course, the war that we just mentioned. War against a soul and war against a body. The, the crime of destroying a body which doesn't destroy a soul, you won't like this, or maybe you will, but that's not as bad from a Jewish, from a Torah perspective, as a war against the soul. After all, after a human death, the soul lives on and indeed could come back. The Alshuk deals with reincarnation very, very frequently. But if you destroy a soul, then it's not coming back. So it's a much, much worse thing. Here, of course, there was both, but we'll come to that shortly. Okay, now, so Garishan Otsam Oid. Then we consider the first category, a war in the soul, much worse. Kinaga Ada Nefesh Vim is there because you're killing a soul. Which is not the case of a mere war against the physical existence of a Jew. Therefore, he says, and that's why, with regards to Edom, the quintessential enemy of the Jewish people, the forefather psychologically, uh, philosophically, and indeed we believe actually uh, genetically and spiritually too, um, of the Nazis. And yet, they're able to convert and become Jews. An Edomite, one of Asa's children, can become a Jew. Um, and not only that, the Mitzrayim. And think of the incredible oppression the Egyptians put us under. That too, when they tried to kill us, but still, a Mitzri, an Egyptian, can convert and become a Jew. But there are other categories of people who can't convert and become a Jew. Those who try to destroy a Jewish soul, not Jewish lives. And here in the Midianites mean the war is to completely destroy Midian for what they did. Lord Tesav, Daimi, the Lord Tesav, Mitzri, and the Posse says, don't detest or reject an, an, an Edomite or an Egyptian. But the people who made you do things wrong which could destroy your soul, then they have to be destroyed. But not only Indian. So the Alshu says, let's get down to really analyzing what's going on here. There were two, and again, we're back to the theme of tonight's year. Remember, it's a story of twos. There were two crimes that the Midianites um, uh, wanted to, uh, to, uh, to commit. One was Achaz and Ogeis El Nefesh. Indeed, as we said, they wanted to destroy the Jewish souls. Um, they, gotten, they got the Jewish people to engage in behavior that they knew Hashem hated. Remember this whole idea of Midian seducing Midianite women, seducing the Jewish people, was at the instigation and through the information of Bilam, who knew us well. Who knew us well. Um, I can't resist telling you, if I can pause for a second, I will be back. I can't resist telling you, I'm showing you something amazing. Sorry, this is to show that the shear is spontaneous. Um, even though I have my notes here, it is all prepared. But uh, I want to tell you something incredibly interesting. Our enemies understand us, as it's obviously in our interest, as we sent in spies, to understand our enemies. Never make the mistake of, of being unaware that our enemies understand us too. Here's a book, which I just, just popped into my head, but I couldn't resist going to get it. I'm over on my secular shelf over there. Eichmann in my hands. It was written by somebody called Peter Malkin. I had the enormous privilege of having Peter Malkin in my house in Manchester. Oh, it must have been back, oh, maybe 20 years ago, uh, when he was speaking to my university students. Peter Malkin um, is the, was the leader of the, um, the commandos, or the spies, the group, who went to Argentina and caught Adolf Eichmann, who was the architect of the Holocaust. He was pretending to be called something called Ricardo Clemens. It was interesting when they eventually got him to admit that he was Adolf Eichmann. They got him to lose, lose his temper. After interrogation, after interrogation, this fellow, Peter Malkin, tiny fellow, shouted at him, you are Obergruppensführer um, Adolf Eichmann and your SS number is 79423. His SS number is 79424. That's how they got him. But the intriguing thing in the story here is that 
he went and dressed as a businessman, went to Hungary, freely conversed with the Jews, um, scoped out, if that's the phrase. He examined very carefully the workings and the nature of the Jewish people. He went to Palestine. And they asked him, why did you go to Palestine? It was for my work, he said ominously. And of course, uh, in conjunction with the Hitler, in conjunction with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, and were quite ready to uh, uh, finish off the Jewish settlement of Eretz Israel, which would have pleased the Palestinians no end. Um, to, that was his work. The interesting thing is that he was very, very well versed in everything Jewish. He did his research. He explained he did his research. He admitted it. And when they were eventually taking him on the plane that would fly him to Israel to his trial and eventual um, conviction and execution, he turned to Peter Malkin. This is not in the book. Peter Malkin told me this. Um, insisted that he never hated Jews. And then said the following thing. Shema Yisrael. Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. The Ohav to us Hashem Elokeinu Bechol Ohav Bechol Nash Bechol Nadeh. And recited in Hebrew the first paragraph of the Shema. He really had done his research. You've got to know your enemy in order to destroy your enemy. And Bilam was our enemy, having failed to be able to curse the Jewish people uh, at, the, at the request of the Moabites. Then he said, but I know how to get them. I can tell you what to do to make sure that you will lose them the support and protection of their God, because he hates sexual immorality and hates idolatry. So get your woman to seduce them. Remember, Hashem, as we said, two approaches. That was last week's Parsha. Only one, only one provoked God's anger. The people who should have known better. So let me go back and read this to you. So he says the following thing. The novel in one, Magez al in the, the crime of the Midianites was really very intense. First of all, it was against our, uh, the Jewish soul, to destroy the Jewish soul, to decouple us from Hashem, to get us to do something that would offend God to such a degree that he, our connection with him would be listened. That was the plan. He was, had done his research. It was for his work. Um, to get them to do things that God hates. One, Zima. Sexual immorality, two of a desire. But on the other hand, uh, the outcome of that was the death of 24,000 Jews. Shane is Therefore, he also caused the Midianites, also caused the physical deaths of the Jewish people. Uh, the Luli Pinchas and hadn't been for Pinchas and what Pinchas did, then at that point, there would have been uh, the end of the Jewish people. That was indeed their purpose. Okay, so Nikom Nikom, it's a double expression. Because there's two things going on, two elements of the attack that has to be put right. And Mosh is the one who's supposed to do it. We've still got to ask our question, how? I, and saying we're on the subject of, of the Nazis, I can't resist reading to you what Rabbeinu Bachia says, Rabbeinu Bachia. Uh, this is not the Ashur, but it's something I would like very much to share as part of the Shia. You know that when Mosh says to the Jewish people, you've got to go and fight a war, in fact, it's, it's here on the page, then it says, go and fight a war against Nicholas Hashem the Midian, a war of, of vengeance for God. But Hashem didn't say that. He said, go and fight a war of vengeance for what he did against the Jewish people. That's going to be important. And I'll stop sharing the screen. And I hope you have got that there. Um, here, he says something interesting. Listen to this. So basically, Moshe said, Hashem said to Moshe, go and fight a war of vengeance on behalf of the Jewish people for what they did to you. And Moshe changes it and says, we're going to fight a war of vengeance on behalf of Hashem, what he did to him. Listen to this, Rabina Bakhia. Nicholas bin Israel and Moshe Omar Nicholas Hashem. Hashem said, a war of vengeance on behalf of the Jews. Moshe said, a war of vengeance on behalf of Hashem. Omar Moshe Moshe said to Hashem, Rabbani Shalani, if we were uncircumcised, or if we worship idols, as they do, what are you signing for son? They wouldn't hate us at all. Um, we'd just be another, another people, like the Italians, or the Irish, or the Greeks, the Spanish, the Russians. Therefore, why do they hate us? 
because of the mitzvahs that you gave us. And the Koma Shalcho, therefore you're telling us to go and fight a war of vengeance on us? A war of vengeance on our behalf is a war of vengeance on your behalf. They only hate us because of you. They only hate us because we are loyal to you. If you go to war, if you hate Jews, really, the underlying factor is you hate God. No, you really hate God. And I don't mean that in some sort of abstract way. It's real. The values that the Jewish people have accepted upon themselves from the Torah, the world hates. That old-fashioned family model, um, you know, social justice, real social justice, all that stuff. The world hates it. To hate the Jews, to fight against the Jews, is to declare war and Noah. That's why Moshe changes it. Oh, you want us, you want us, uh, you're saying that it's a war uh, uh, of vengeance, what they did to us? That is a war, what they did to you, or tried to do to you. It's the same thing. We are two. Shema Yisrael Hashem Akinu, Hashem Echod. And in Shabbos Milch, we say, Atzo Echod, Mishim Echod, Mika Am Chizrael, Goy Echod Boret. Two ones. We're back to our twos. Anyway, back to, uh, back to this, and listen to this. The Jewish people and God being one, that we saw in Rabbeinu Bachaya, beautifully, beautifully uh, explained here in the, in the Al-Shemis. Another thing, they tried to kill our souls, but they also tried to kill our bodies, and indeed they succeeded in getting 24,000 Jews killed. But Luli Pinchas, and it hadn't been for, Min, for Pinchas done, it did, then we would have been finished. Well, his Baruch has we would have been finished. We in Suffolk. And both those elements were what was Hashem was calling now, now, as, on us now to avenge. Same idea as the Rebbein Bachaya. Because the pain, the physical pain that they, 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 and the spiritual pain that they uh, managed to impose upon the Jewish people, that was pain for God too, as the apostle famously says in Yom Yoho, in Cheskov Gimel, and when it says, in all of their pain, Lloyd saw. Hashem has pain as well. So it was a war against Hashem and a war against the Jewish people. That's going to be very, very important. Now, here is, the Elsha goes on to a very interesting Medrash Rabba. And again, I've got to read this to you. In Yom Yoho, Says the rabbis tell us the Medrash Rabbah, Kof Kof A, uh, chapter 2025. Hashim Moshe, they charge Moshe and find him guilty or find him wanting when it came at Shalokina Esmaisa Zimriva Harukai, going back to the whole war of Midian and what happened. And when, of course, if you remember, when the head of the tribe of Shimon, uh, Zimri, arrives with a, 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 a Midianite princess. And says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Zu mutali Allah, is this woman permissible to me or not? So Moshe says no, and he said, Well, in that case, who allowed you to view a Midianite woman? Because of course Moshe had married Yisra's daughter, and she was a Midianite. Quite a chutzpah. So let's that's the the topic in the Khumish. Here's what the Medrash Rabbah says. In a Razinazal Hashima is Moshe, the, the find Moshe wanting, but he didn't do what Pincus did and acted to kill him for his incredible crime. Because the law is that anybody who does what he did, and a Kanoi, somebody who's zealous for God, should do what Pincus did. So why didn't you do it, Moshe? Because of every, of any, more than anybody, the matter concerned him. The criticism, the offense, the rebellion was against him. If I'm not allowed to have my non Jewish wife, who allowed you to have your non Jewish wife? Elisha Pinchus, Omer, Bamokam, Shiesh, Kil Hashem, in Cholkim Kabbalah. But Pinchus said that the halacha, which I've remembered, is that when it's a matter of kill Hashem, you don't. There's COVID harav. There's the you give priority to the rabbi. You go to the rabbi first and ask him. No, no. Pinka said no. When it comes to kill Hashem, just grab the spear and and do something. 
That's answer number one. Answer number two is the one that, uh, that Rashi brings, which is that he forgot the halacha. Pinchas remembered the halacha and Pinchas went and acted. So therefore, on that basis, this bit that the complaint is on, on Moshe, that he didn't act, forget the Rashi explanation, but the complaint against Moshe that he didn't act, and Pinchas did, he want, the Alshik wants to explore that Medrash. And he says, Why is the complaint, and why is the Medrash saying that it's exclusively or more than anything else an attack on Moshe, and therefore consequently should have acted? He says, Sha'al Kain Omr Sha'al Mashem Bemokam Kil Hashem. That's why he's on say, ah, but because there was a Kil Hashem, Pinchas rushed in there. But it applied to everybody, it applied to everybody, and it applied to Moshe. Ach, Omnom Hinebi Yichud Nogea Hadover Be Etzem El Moshe O El Pinchas. But the truth is, the chutzpah of Zimri was directed chiefly against Pinchas and against Moshe. Let me read this to you. You are similar to Israel, more than anybody else. That will justify the criticism of the Medrash. Therefore, why didn't Moshe act? Well, let's see how that develops. Moshe also had no similar Of course, it's an attack on Moshe because he, might, he too was married to a Midianite woman. Of course, one who converted to become a Jew, one of the greatest Jewish women in history, as far as. Baal Yomer Sha'al Kain Hoya Michani for Lokona, Aldover, Kelsby, Bas Nosi Midian. And the, so that people should, you should certainly act so that they don't think that the reason you do, aren't acting is because you've got a soft spot for the Midianites. That there's a point to his argument that you married a Midianite woman. Well, the Pinkos, the same criticism about Pinkos. He comes from a Midianite woman because his father, Allah Zarakon, married one, another one of Lot's daughters. So therefore, again, there'd be an attack on him. But came and Allah and Allah himself who married a Midianite woman. Why didn't he do it? So he says, with regard to him, there's a very, very simple reason. And that is, he's a Kohen. A Kohen can't go out to war, can't fight. And he's the Kohen Godel. So he's a bit frozen. But it certainly, that still leaves Pinchas and Moshe. Now, Pinchas acts, but the complaint is Moshe should have acted because of the two, Pinchas and Moshe, the attack on Moshe is even worse. Why? He Hekish Zenusa and Nisa Moshe Acha Shigaira. Because in drawing a comparison about this non Jewish woman, this non Jewish Midianite princess, to his wife, who was a Midianite, but then became a Jew, and the halacha is that somebody who becomes a Jew is like somebody who's completely new, newly born, and you're not allowed to remind the convert of their, of their background. That meant that of the two, this was a greater offense. And why didn't Moshe act? Why didn't Moshe act? Well, then it says, remember one of our questions, the Asha's question was, why is the war against Midian going to be the, 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 the trigger that provokes Moshe's death? Not before. But when, it, when that happens, then, then he can die. And here, he says something very interesting. After you were gathered to your people. Hashem loves Moshe Rabbeinu. Hashem wants to give him a chance. He has delayed, he should have acted, he could have acted. But because he didn't, Hashem wants to give him a chance to put it right before he dies. And what he wants to do is to go and fight a war against the Midianites to wipe this, his personal slate clean before he comes to heaven. But the astonishing thing, as the Alshad points out, is he doesn't do it. Instead, he gets them to go and do what, they're, that what the, the war is all about, instead of him leading them themselves. Why doesn't he do it? So the answer goes back to what we said before. Even though the attack on the Jewish people is ultimately an attack on Hashem, as the Alshak said, and as the Red Bechaya said, well, how did Hashem frame this? Go and fight a war against Midian on behalf of the Jewish people and the offense they suffered. Because the humility of Hashem, and there are many Pesachim that talk about Hashem being the ultimate honor of the ultimate a humble being, is that he puts Klal Yisrael first. And when he does that, Moshe learns from that. He knows that Hashem is giving him the opportunity to wipe the slate clean. But if Hashem is putting the Jewish people first, so will I. 
it will be enough for me that I um, marshaled the army, that I sent the army rather than lead it, because I want them to have a war of the vengeance, which will wipe their slate clean. It's a beautiful idea. And so he sends them. Now we had said, why didn't he go himself? And Hashem says, I want you to go and fight the war. Because I learned from you, Hashem. You prioritize the Jewish people. I'll prioritize the Jewish people too. As you love Klaus Israel, so do I. And I will learn from you. And that answers all of the anxious questions. But this idea that the Jewish people and Hashem are intertwined and inseparable is something Hashem himself says numerous times in the Torah. I'll never forget you. No matter how bad, no matter what you've done that's so terrible, even when you behave so badly that I have to destroy my temple, my place on earth to be with you, that's what I'll do rather than destroy you. I can't destroy you. You are my daughter. You are my son. My firstborn son. I can punish him, but I can never give you up. Because you and I are joined. We should all be very good Shabbos. I look forward to seeing you next week.